Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, we'll continue. We were looking at uh, uh, verse 11 and 12 of uh, First Timothy chapter 2. And we were looking at, you know, you know is Paul really mean, meaning that a woman should be silent in church and, uh, you know, be under submission and that he does not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over man. So we looked at uh, what was um, uh, Paul's own ministry practice. Uh, we saw that he had women who were part of his uh, uh, you know, ministry team, he appointed them as leaders. There were uh, min uh, women who were uh, deacons, leaders, and apostles. We also see that when he's writing about the gifts of the Spirit in First Corinthians chapter 12, uh, when he is, um, you know, and he's uh, uh, talking about the ministry gifts uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, uh, it's not any gender specific but it's inclusive of all genders, male and female. He does not mention any one specific gender. Uh, we also see this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, where he's talking about the ministry gifts of being apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. There again, he does not specific any one, uh, does not specifically mention any one gender, but uh, he says uh, that the ministry gifts is given to people and it can mean both male and uh, female. Okay. Now we'll move on to see uh, the context in which Paul's uh, writing this uh, to Timothy. Uh, why is he writing these lines? Let a woman remain silent in all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to remain silent. Now, when we are trying to interpret this uh, in the context of what Paul is writing, we also need to see what Paul is writing in his previous episodes what he addresses previously. We know that Paul, uh, you know, when he's writing um, his epistles, sometimes he's addressing it specifically to uh, just one church uh, in a specific geographical location, or sometimes he's just talk, speaking or giving a command uh, or speaking uh, generally that is inclusive of all churches across all geographical uh, locations. Now, sometimes he's speaking basically uh, and specifically just to one particular church in one geographical location. For example, you know, the whole thing about uh, head covering where he's talking about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says he wants women to cover the head. Uh, uh, there in that situation, it's clearly he's mentioning in the same chapter in verse 16 uh, that this sort of custom is not among other churches. Okay, so this that custom was specifically for the church at Corinth, and he was addressing it specifically for that church. Doesn't mean that today that women have to cover their head. Similarly, you know, when he's talking about um, and he's encouraging everyone, male and female, to exercise the gifts of the spirit. Um, you know, uh, in uh, prophesying, teaching, uh, tongues, interpreting of tongues. In First Corinthians chapter fourteen, verse twenty-six. He also gives some specific instruction on these things of prophesying, teaching, uh, speaking in tongues, interpreting in tongues. He specifically gives specific instruction to women, to prophets, and to those speaking in uh, tongues. Uh, he says that those speaking in tongues, you know, they should remain silent. When should they remain silent? He says when there is no interpreter remain silent so that you know those who are unbelievers when they come to the gathering they don't think you know that you're possessed or this total chaos and confusion in the church and they don't want to go there again and in this context he also gives specific instruction to the prophets the church at corinth he's saying prophets when you prophesy you know each of you have a prophecy to say uh, that's okay that's good but take turns one by one so when one finishes the other keeps silent. And in the same context, he's, he's giving uh, an instruction to women. He says, women keep silent and, you know, ask their husbands at home if they have any uh, uh, doubts. Now, why is he saying women keep silent? So that there is a proper order in the church. Now, we should know that many of these um, 
uh, church is comprised of uh, uh, Gentile believers who came from their pagan culture. And, you know, uh, there they were quite loud and talking and laughing and discussing. But um, uh, Paul is trying to say that in the church, there is a specific order that we uh, that we follow we'll talk about this uh, later on you know and he says we need to honor that government that structure that order that is brought about in the uh, house of god and we need to maintain it okay so that is what he's saying uh, there okay and um, similarly um, you know when he's writing to uh, timothy he's writing in the context of the local church there at ephesus and he's asking women to keep silent in the church. Why is he asking women to the to keep silent in the church? Now we look at the cultural and the historical setting. Like we looked at the, uh, uh, and we um, heard in the introduction, the background to this whole uh, episode, this whole letter. Uh, we knew that, uh, we learned that Ephesus uh, was a city which was very famous for what? It was very famous for something what was it famous for anyone remembers yeah it was famous for the temple uh, of the uh, goddess diana okay um, and we see that everything in that city was uh, centered around this uh, so-called goddess Diana, and um, uh, who are the priests in this um, in this um, uh, temple? There were basically women priestess who ran the show there, and. Uh, Paul is saying that he does not want to replicate the same structure that was going on in that temple in the church. But he's saying in the church, Paul is saying he wants God's government to be in place uh, and uh, God's order to be established. And in he's saying in the church, we need to honor God's government. Okay. Now, um, there, in the notes, you can see there is a, uh, a mention of a book, I Suffer Not a Woman. And it's talking about certain cultic practices uh, involving the female priests um, of the goddess uh, uh, Diana. And, um, you know, these uh, women, um, you know, to, uh, who perform these rituals, they pronounce curses on men to declare their female superiority. Okay, they um, performed uh, rituals and they pro uh, pronounced curses on men to declare their female superiority. And uh, Paul is saying that, you know, um, uh, that, you know, he does not allow women to teach these cultic heresies and he does not want them to, uh, and he will not allow uh, the women to take authority from men by performing the same pagan rituals in the church okay and by saying that he's saying that you know there's a government there's an god god given government a god given order a god given structure in the church and we need to uh, follow that and he's not saying as some christians assume that uh, you know i i do not allow godly christian women to teach the bible that is not what paul is saying but he's saying that he won't allow women to teach these cultic heresies or bring about these cultic practices in the church uh, to take authority over men by performing these pagan um, rituals okay so the the whole issue here is about submission and yielding to men when it comes to leadership and uh, teaching. So these women might not be accepting it because some of them might have seen this uh, leadership of women in the church, the superiority of women, sorry, uh, uh, leadership and superiority of women in the temple. Uh, and w women had maybe had an upper hand in the in the society as well. They had a say. Maybe they were also acting superior uh, to men in the uh, in the social setting, in also uh, the structure at home. And Paul is saying that that will not happen here in the 
church. In the church here, you know, there should be submission and yielding of women to men when it comes to leadership and what they are teaching. Um, and Paul reminds them of, uh, uh, you know, man's headship in God's government and uh, by stating that Adam was formed first. So in God's government, in his order, in his structure for the church, you know, man is the head. Okay. And uh, uh, hence, you know, women have to be in submission to men leaders and uh, uh, their authority and their uh, teaching and he's not prohibiting women uh, from ministering or serving uh, God, but they need to do it uh, uh, in humility, in submission to men uh, and following a proper code of uh, uh, conduct in the local church setting uh, uh, compared to what they follow in their own cultural uh, context. So in the light of this cultural context, Paul is bringing about this rule here in the church uh, so that there is no chaos, there is no confusion, there is God's government and order that is followed of uh, man being the head uh, of uh, or the rest of them, you know, falling in place with uh, uh, the authority and coming under his submission and leadership and um, teaching, okay? So that is uh, in the context of why Paul is writing this uh, uh, to the church at uh, Ephesus. The third thing is the light of rest of the scripture. Now throughout scripture, we see in the Old and New Testament, we see women who are, I have already mentioned this, that they were anointed by the Holy Spirit and they were used by God. And some of them are uh, examples are like Miriam, Deborah, Esther, Ruth, Anna, the prophetess, Philip's daughters, uh, and we also read that in Acts chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, that the outpouring or the promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is for your sons and daughters as well. And both of them will prophesy. Okay. We'll move ahead now to verse 14. Uh, Paul says, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Now, when reading this verse, many people say that, you know, it implies that women can be more easily deceived than men. Now, uh, Apostle Paul is not mentioning that. He's simply stating what had happened in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. We see in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, that Satan directly spoke to uh, Eve or the serpent directly spoke to Eve and lied to her, twisted what God had said. And he was easily uh, deceived. Okay, and she takes the first bite. And um, the serpent did not have to speak to Adam because when Eve gave uh, the fruit uh, to Adam, he ate it without questioning, without asking any questions, um, without doubting. And so we see that both sin and both fell short of the glory of God and, uh, you know, uh, away from the standards of God. So here Paul is not meaning to say that women are more easily deceived than um, men. Okay. Verse 15, uh, Paul is saying, nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Here she is referring to women. Women will be saved in childbearing. Okay. Saved means uh, the word here is preserved. Okay, uh, save the Greek word for the word saved is sozo. And we know that sozo is a very uh, comprehensive word, a very uh, full word in terms of its meaning. Uh, it, uh, it does not mean only, uh, sozo does not just mean forgiveness of sins or uh, is being saved from our sins. It, uh, it also means healing from our sicknesses. It means wholeness. It means deliverance from every uh, demonic bondage and stronghold. It uh, also means uh, preservation from every kind of harm and danger. So it's a very holistic, comprehensive word with, uh, you know, different meanings. And so here, uh, the word saved, sozo means they will be preserved, preserved from all trouble, harm and danger uh, in the context of childbirth. Now, why is Paul mentioning uh, and talking about women and childbirth uh, at this time uh, in his letter? Because um, 
again, we need to see this in the context uh, uh, of the biblical context as well as in the local context. Uh, in the biblical context, we see in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, that, uh, you know, consequences of sin, the curse that came up upon women is that they will have pain during uh, childbirth. Okay, and also we look at the cultural context, the cultural context to understand why Paul is writing it is in the cultural context, you know, um, we see that um, uh, the goddess Diana, okay, um, uh, in the Greek, this word Diana is Artemis, okay, Artemis, uh, uh, so goddess Diana or Artemis used interchangeably, uh, is a god of the opposites, okay, uh, she's a uh, God of the opposites, which means she's a divinity of healing, but also she is a divinity that can bring about uh, or spread diseases like leprosy, rabies, and even gout. Okay, so this, um, you know, uh, this uh, goddess Dinah is known uh, to protect or preserve or help women when they give birth to children. But when they, when uh, the Scottish Diana gets angry, which is also known to, um, you know, um, uh, even cause death uh, to people who are women to give, who are giving birth. Okay, so in this context, Paul is um, bringing about this truth that the God who has redeemed them, the one mediator between God and man, the one. Uh, a man who has paid the full redemption price, uh, you know, will also preserve them uh, uh, during childbirth, will protect them, and they do not have to fear any harm and uh, danger. So, you know, Paul is addressing this in the cultural influence of the worship of Dinah, and he's assuring believers that because they believe in Jesus Christ, they will be preserved in uh, childbirth, okay? So Paul is saying, just like men, women are, women are also to continue in faith, love, holiness, and self-control. Okay. So that brings us to the end of the chapter. Now, what is our key verse or our key takeaway uh, is that, you know, our focus here is that Paul wants everyone, everywhere, at any time to pray with all kinds of prayer, supplication, intercession, um, requests, and uh, uh, to make our thanks known to God so that we can live, sorry, a peaceful, quiet life, and we can live with all godliness and reverence uh, so that people will be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth in Christ Jesus. So that is the key takeaway of this uh, chapter. Any doubts, any questions? In chapter two? No, if not, we'll move. Uh, okay, it's clear. We'll move to chapter three. Um, let's look at the um, Chapter 3, can somebody read verses uh, 1 to 7 of chapter 3, please? Quickly, can somebody read uh, verses 1 to 7? This is faithful saying, if from as the position of a bishop, he desire a good work, a bishop then must be a blameless, a husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of a good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not to give wine, not violent, greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelism, covetous, not who rules his own house, his children in submission with all reverence. And in bracket, for if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will take care of his care of the church of God? Not, not a novice, lest being puffed up with the pride, we fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, they must have a good testament, have a good testament among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach the snare of the devil. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. So here Paul begins uh, or continues writing his letter. Uh, we are looking at 
at uh, it as chapter three, where he's saying this is a faithful saying. So this is a faithful saying means Paul has just written uh, two women saying that in God's house, there is a proper order, that men are the head and women are to walk in submission to men. But this does, this does not deprive women of operating in the gifts of the spirit or operating in their calling that God has placed on their life. So having said that, he now moves on to address other things in the, sorry, he moves on to address other things in the local church. Now, if we read Philippians chapter one, we see that in the early church, uh, you know, people were in three different categories. Uh, one is saints, the other is bishops, and the third is deacons, okay? Um, so in the church, you know, we see three categories of people, saints, bishops, and deacons. Who are the saints? Any idea who are saints? Saints are everyone, all believers. You and I are also called saints. And then there are bishops. Now, what do we mean by this word bishop? If you look at it in today's world, bishop means somebody who's the spiritual head, okay? The, 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 the authority, the, the supreme authority in, in different churches like we have in the, uh, I don't know if in the Baptist, but uh, you know, in the CSI church, we have the Methodist church, we have bishop. And everybody else are under this main leader who is the bishop. But in the early church, uh, during Paul's time, uh, you know, bishop had a totally different uh, understanding and a meaning. The Greek word for bishop is episcope, which means a spiritual leader, uh, someone who is involved in spiritual ministry, uh, someone who is giving basically spiritual inputs into the lives of God's people. And uh, in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, uh, we read uh, bishops as spiritual overseers who are to shepherd uh, the people of God and take care of uh, them. So they're basically, uh, you know, people who are uh, spiritual leaders. So if you look at it in... in um, in, in the present context of our church, if you interpret this in the present context of our church, a bishop can be anyone who is a worship leader, youth pastor, children's church pastor, uh, you know, life group pastors, uh, etc. Okay. And deacons. Now, who are deacons? Deacons are people who are responsible for any administrative, organizational uh, work, uh, which involves supporting and help. Uh, or in a function that they have to support and help uh, in the church. And it all began in Acts chapter 6, where they had to find out seven men who were full of the wisdom, or full of wisdom and full of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and when they chose these seven men, what was their role? Their role was to serve food every day to all the poor uh, people and the widows. Okay. Now the deacons grew out of that context. Uh, and since deacons were involved in uh, more administrative organizational uh, work uh, in a setting or in a support and help function, it does not mean that they were not or should not be involved in spiritual aspects or in spiritual ministry. Uh, we see one of the deacons, Philip, uh, who was involved in spiritual ministry. He went to Samaria. Uh, he taught the word. He did mighty signs, miracles, and wonders. Whole of Samaria accepted Jesus. They were baptized and then um, also later on baptized in the Holy uh, Spirit. Okay, So that is the meaning of the word of bishops and also um, deacons. <coughs> Sorry. Paul says, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Okay, so he's saying that, you know, Paul is saying it's a good thing to desire, okay, uh, desire to help others in the church, uh, desire to do good work in the, uh, in the church. Now, if you think about uh, this word deacon and interpreted in our present day context, can be people who are in the ushering team, welcome team, you know, offering team or uh, first time visitors team, all of these people are called as um, deacons. Okay, so uh, Paul is saying it's good to desire to help in the church to do good work in the church and don't quench that desire. But he's saying but there is some standard 
that God expects of us as leaders. Okay, God expects some basic standard, um, and He goes on to list it out in verses uh, two to five. Uh, he, where He's talking about a bishop. When he says a bishop must be blameless, that means he must live a life that people cannot find fault with. He must live the right kind of life in uh, the presence of God, in the presence of man, the church and the world at large. He must be a husband of one wife, temperate, that means he must be self-controlled. He must be sober-minded means that he must be emotionally stable uh, he must have a good behavior which means he should not uh, you know be uh, uh, having a childish kind of a behavior hospitable you know able to entertain um, people in his home take care of people help them and he's able to teach okay now if you notice in this list that Paul enlists about who a leader should be, the qualities, uh, what are the ingredients, so to say, of a leader. Uh, he's, we see in this list that uh, only once does he mention uh, or uh, say anything to do with gifts, okay? And that is teaching, okay? So only one thing that he is mentioning here about uh, your gifting is uh, teaching, but the rest of it is dealing with you uh, or who you are as a person. So, you know, uh, the kind of life that we live is very, very important. It's God's standard and it's God's requirement to be a spiritual leader. Now, you know, in the churches, uh, we may... Uh, mostly churches look or emphasize at the giftings of a people, of a person, of a leader. Okay, it's important. Give things are important for them to uh, for them to uh, work effectively, minister effectively uh, in their uh, leadership uh, position, and it's important for God as well. Okay, but and um, for but God is saying that for spiritual leadership, it's not just gifting; it's also about who you are as a person. Okay, so we need to hold people accountable to this. And we need to hold ourselves accountable to all of these things that are listed here. You might think it's, you know, not very necessary, you know, uh, give things is more necessary, but this is, this is very, very important because it's important to God. It's listed here in scripture. It's mentioned here in scripture. And if it's mentioned, it's important for uh, spiritual leadership and people need to hold themselves accountable. We need to hold ourselves accountable to this, uh, you know, and we just cannot uh, put our gifts on display, but we need to hold uh, ourselves accountable to God's standard to minister. Okay. Having said that, we'll move on to the other things that Paul mentions here or lists out. He says, not given to wine. Some people say it's okay to drink a little wine, but, uh, you know, at APC, uh, our standard is no wine, uh, not violent. Violent means, you know, just a, a person who is very gentle, uh, not greedy for money, uh, you know, uh, but gentle, not quarrelsome and not covetous. Okay, so we should not overlook all of these standards. Uh, we need to uphold this standards in the house of God. So if you're a leader in your church, you need to ensure that all of them who are leading or all of them who are serving, even all of those who are helping, whether it's just serving a cup of tea or, you know, uh, the welcome team, you know, they should uphold to this um, standards uh, that are mentioned in the scripture that has been listed out to us by uh, Paul. And it uh, and God requires this, and he requires uh, us to uphold this in his house. Okay, in verse 4, he says that one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all uh, reverence. Now, it's important um, that, you know, a, a leader, uh, you know, uh, has his own family in order. Because when our own family is in order, uh, then we are in a place of strength to minister to 
others. Now, if our own family is not in order, there's chaos, there's confusion, there's strife, there's brokenness, you know, we are not in a place of strength, we are in a place of weakness, we are in a place of disappointment, frustration, bitterness, anger, and we cannot minister out of that kind of an uh, attitude or a mindset or an emotional, uh, 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 you know, state that we are in, you know, God's presence cannot flow mightily in and through us. So it's important that our house is in order uh, uh, so that we are in a place of strength to minister to others. Verse 6, Paul says, you should, that the leader or a bishop should not be a novice, uh, less being puffed up with pride, you fall into the same condemnation as the devil. A novice means a new, a novice is a new believer in Christ Jesus. So when a new believer comes to church, now don't be too quick to put him into a position of spiritual um, leadership. Okay, uh, give him or her time to grow, observe them, uh, you know, uh, give them time to grow and mature, um, give them a little responsibility, see how they do, see their attitude, train them, groom them, mold them. And, uh, you know, when they're mature enough, then give them, uh, you know, important uh, leadership roles. Now, why should we do that, Paul is saying? Because when we give them a, a leadership role or a position, when they are a new believer, when they are novice in Christ, they will be filled up with pride. Okay? Now, why is uh, pride uh, so dangerous or why it's important for us to note it here? Because Satan fell because of his pride. Okay? So this person will come under the same condemnation when Satan uh, was filled with pride. We know that, you know, God threw him out of his presence. And so here, uh, this person will also be condemned. They will be cast out of God's presence. Uh, we, we know that scripture says that God resists the proud. Uh, and, uh, you know, he will be totally disconnected from the presence of God. So to avoid all of these things, you know, train, groom, help the person mature, and then give him some specific leadership roles and uh, responsibilities, okay? And then Paul goes on to say, moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into the approach and the snare of the devil, okay? Now, um, verse 7 um, in the ERB, that is an easy to read version, says an elder must also have the respect of people who are not part of the church. Then he will not be criticized by others and be caught in the devil's trap. Now, for us to understand this and reading the uh, ERB, that is an easy to read version, uh, I'll, I'll read that again. An elder must also have respect of people who are not part of the church, then he will not be criticized by others and be caught in the devil's trap. Now, an important part of being a spiritual leader is having a good relationship, not only with God, not only with people in the church, with other fellow believers, but also uh, with people around us, people of the world. Okay. So, a way a spiritual leader must live, they must live faultless before the uh, world. Why? Because if he is disgraced before the world, you know, then the devil can use it as a trap to uh, bring them down. Now we see, uh, you know, uh, men and women of God in history, um, they fell you know, uh, from their ministry positions, their leadership, their ministries fell because they did something wrong. The world has noticed it and they have portrayed it in the, uh, and reported uh, their wrongdoing in the news. And the whole ministry comes crashing, the whole church uh, breaks and it's uh, has been a very sad state of affairs. So it's important for us to live right in the sight of God, in the church and before the world. Any questions or doubts so far? No, if there are no questions, we'll move on to verses uh, 8 to 13. Uh, in 8 to 13, he's talking to deacons, uh, anyone who serves or helps in the 
function uh, uh, as a helper, as the administrative role, organizational role. Okay, so we look at um, what Paul lists out of who a deacon should be. So if you look at it in our present day context, deacons are basically those who are part of the connect team, uh, the greeters team, those who are... Uh, <clears throat> you know, the part of the first time visitors team, etc. Okay, so can somebody read verses 8 to 13, please? Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double tongue, not given too much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let this also first be test tested, then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Likewise, their waves must be reverent, not slenders, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own house well. For those who have served well as the deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Kiran. So here, uh, Paul is beginning by saying that likewise, that means just like what he has mentioned for bishops, the same way deacons must be reverent, that means they must hold uh, or have reverence to the house of God or the things of God. Everything that they do, they should do reverently with reverence. Uh, so they had need to go about doing things in reverence to the thing, the things of God and the house of God. And then he lists out the same things that he lists out for, um, you know, the requirements, uh, the like, kind of life they need to live as leaders in the church that he lists out for uh, bishops. In verse 9, it's um, really interesting to note that he talks about faith with a pure conscience. And uh, as I said uh, in the last class, you know, he keeps repeating this. Uh, he's again repeating it here and you know, uh, by repeating it, he's um, giving us or uh, showing the importance of holding on to our faith with a good conscience. So even if your spiritual leaders are not watching over you, you know, you might not have your senior pastor who's always watching you or, uh, you know, your uh, your, uh, whoever you're working under, your spiritual leaders not watching over you, but your conscience holds you accountable okay your conscience holds you accountable so paul is saying here that even if the spiritual leaders are not constantly watching over you seeing you but you are accountable to god uh, and your conscience holds you accountable and then he says but let these also first be tested then let them serve as deacons uh, being found blameless so first we need to um, you know test uh, those we are putting into leadership uh, positions, um, examine those uh, desiring to serve, give them, you know, some simple, small things to do. Uh, and when you, when, when they're doing it, watch their attitude, uh, see their commitment, um, see they're doing it well, see they're doing it sincerely, faithfully. And then if you notice, yes, they're having a consistent commitment and ad right attitude uh, of serving, of being sincere, of being faithful, then you can put them into a place of uh, higher leadership position and responsibility. So he says, let, let these also be tested, then put them in the position as uh, deacons when they are found to be blameless. And verses 11 to 12, Paul lists out the same requirements as uh, for deacons, as he mentioned, for bishops, I'm not going to go through that again. But in verse 13, he says, for those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a good standing and a great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So as uh, Paul is saying, when somebody serves well as a deacon, there are two things they obtain. The first thing is a good standing which means that they are in a place of stature, of strength before God and man. And the second thing is that they have great boldness in their faith, which is in Christ Jesus, okay? Which means that they can be bold, they can be confident about their faith, about who they are as believers, who they are in Christ, and they have this confidence that they're able to provide leadership and they're in a place of strength to serve. 
uh, why why can uh, why can they um, you know think that they are in a good standing and uh, in great boldness because of their track record because of how they have served thus far okay and here paul says you know those who have those who have served well obtain okay the other word for obtain is earn so it's not something that you just receive a good standing and um, great boldness in the faith but you earn it uh, it's by keeping a good track record of being committed sincere faithful and when you do that you earn a good standing a good stature and strength before god and man and also you have great boldness and faith in christ jesus okay for those who have served well as deacons so paul is saying god remembers their faithful service even in their menial task something as simple is considered as menial as just standing you know in the in the uh, you know uh, the main gate or the main entrance to the building of the church and just greeting people or just serving tea or serving coffee you know uh, paul is saying that uh, you know when you serve well uh, even though people consider this this is a very small menial job you're doing just set up uh, or you're packing the uh, doing pack up or you're just setting up the chairs or you're washing the communion cups uh, you know whatever you're doing might be a menial small job but god remembers that um and he sees their faithful service he remembers your faithful service the faith which is in christ jesus as all workers of uh, uh, all servant leaders in god's family uh you know uh, they point their life their leadership uh, towards building god's people in faith which is in christ jesus so when we serve with the servant leadership attitude we're automatically pointing people to christ uh, through our attitude to the our life the way that we are serving and then paul goes on to talk about <laughs> sorry proper conduct in god's house can somebody read uh, verses 14 and 15 please all of this yeah go ahead siddat Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you this instruction so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Thank you. So here, Paul is, uh, you know, uh, writing his desire, his hope uh, to come and uh, meet uh, Timothy, uh, but. it's just a desire you know uh, and he longs to see him personally but he knows that it might not be uh, possible um as soon as he's wishing that he could come and see him but uh, paul makes sure that he's writing this letter and mentioning everything that he wants uh, timothy and the church to know he says uh, he he writes and says how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of god now paul's purpose for writing this letter was to give timothy uh you know who is a leader practical information on how to run uh you know uh, the things in the church how to establish god's government order uh, in the church and then he calls the church as the house of uh, god okay um now we know that the church is a place um uh, where we experience god's presence where god is very much present uh and so we know the church is a place that people desire to go to just experience the presence of god uh, uh and uh, the house of god um or the church is god's house because uh you know he is the architect he is the builder his presence is very much there he provides for his people his honor there and uh, we see his kingdom reign his kingdom rule his kingdom activity is very very his kingdom presence very much present in the church and paul goes on to say that the church uh, is not only the house of god but is also the church of the living god okay the church of the living god uh, so it means that the living god has called his people together for his purpose now in the ancient greek language uh, the word church 
uh, was a non-religious word for a group of people who were called together for a specific purpose. Uh, you know, uh, it can be any purpose. They want to clean the city or they want to, you know, uh, do something for the city or they want to uh, speak against something that's happening in the city. So it's a group of people coming. So it's uh, basically looked at in a very non-religious term. And... Uh, but here Paul is saying that the church is the church of the living God. That means uh, it's, uh, it's his people, uh, the people of the living God, uh, you know, who he calls together to fulfill his purpose. So the church is a group of people coming together uh, because they belong to the living God and they are called or gathered by the living God to fulfill his purpose. So church is not to fulfill our purpose, to run our agendas, to do our will, to bring in our kingdom, but it is to do the will of the living God, to fulfill his purpose. And then he goes on to also say that the church is a pillar and a ground of truth. Okay, the pillar and ground means the church is a foundation uh, of the truth. Uh, and, uh, you know, very sadly, today's churches don't value the truth uh, as they should. And therefore, the pillars or their foundation is very, very shaky. Now, Paul's intent in writing this is to show us that there is a proper way to conduct ourselves in the house of God. And while he specifically addresses about bishops and deacons, uh, this also applies to us. Why does it apply to us? Because the local church is the house of God. You know, it's a family of God. Uh, the church is also called the living God. And we are part of the church, the living God, because we are the community of called out ones. We are called out. That means church is ecclesia. We are called out of a, for a specific purpose. Okay, uh, and also the church is a pillar and ground of truth. That means we are the upholders uh, uh, of this truth, this uh, truth that is in God's word, the established truth in God's word. Okay, uh, we won't be able to. Okay, can I just finish the last few verses and then we can end class? We just have two more minutes, but it will take a little longer. I hope it's okay. Is that fine? Yes, no? no? Okay, thank you. So we look at um, uh, the last few, the last verse, verse 16. Can somebody read that, please? Quickly. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, priests, among the Gentiles, beloved on in the world, received up in glory. Okay, thank you, Dave. So here Paul is quoting an hymn uh, to express the foundation of the Christian truth. So he says that as a church, we belong in the church, we are people who are upholders uh, of this foundation of the truth in God's word. And so he's quoting a hymn here. Um, and he's saying, without controversy, okay? Um, which means that the wonderful summary of this Christian truth should be without controversy among believers. Um, but it's sad that some of them, you know, uh, debate on these and deny these fundamental truths. But these truths should be held and believed without any controversies. Then he says, God was manifested in the flesh. And he's talking of the very basic essence of the incarnation, that God, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, uh, added to his deity, humanity, and he manifested himself in the flesh. And then he goes on to say that he was justified in the spirit. Okay, We can say that Jesus was justified in the spirit, not in the sense that he was once a sinner, or once he was sinful and made righteous, we're not saying it in that sense, but in the sense that he was declared to be um, uh, just, righteous, and holy by the Holy Spirit, uh, and that he was always completely justified before the Father. Okay, so we can't say that there was. In, we can can't say that it's mentioned in a sense that he was 
sinful at one time and he need to be justified and be made righteous no we're looking at it in this this sense that he was declared uh, to be always completely justified before the father by the holy spirit and paul also goes on to say that he was seen by angels uh, there were many instances when jesus was seen by angels mark chapter 1 verse 13 Luke chapter 22, verses 41 to 43. And especially at the resurrection, we see that uh, in the tomb, there was an angel. Matthew chapter 28, verse 2 to 7. Then Paul goes on to mention that he was preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world. And um, so we see that uh, Jesus was preached to the Gentiles and Paul himself does this uh, faithfully and sincerely. And he's fulfilling the statement which he's mentioning. He was always busy preaching to about Jesus among the Gentiles and bringing uh, the Gentile world uh, to believing in Jesus Christ. And so he says we need to preach and teach this foundational um, truth to the world. And then he ends by saying that, uh, you know, he was received up in glory. He was taken up in glory. Okay. So he's reminding his readers that Jesus was taken up. Jesus' ascension, Luke chapter 24, verse 51. And Jesus, and he's reminding his readers and reminding Timothy that Jesus finished uh, the work he had to do on our behalf. Uh, we read this in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. And presently, he's interceding on behalf of us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. And so he's, you know, encouraging us that we need to pray for everyone at all times, uh, for those uh, in authority, civil authority, and those who are in the leadership authority in the church. Okay. So that is the end of chapter 3. Anyone has any questions, doubts, any comments to make? Was it clear? Anything you did not understand? Okay, if there is um, no comments, no questions, um, we'll end class. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day and a good week ahead. Uh, I'll see you soon for our next class. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Thomas. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Kiran. Thank you.